Cool. Uh, right. I think we're going to get cracking with stuff. Um, so good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, DDD 2020, uh, the first virtual DDD, I think. Um, I've just got a couple of slides I'm going to run through first, some housekeeping bits. Um, so uh, firstly, um, here's our code of conduct. Um, you know, it's pretty sensible stuff, but um, if we could all think about that, it's great. Um, we've also got the sponsor, uh, oh sorry, the charity for this year's event, so the National Museum of Computing as well. So um, yeah, if you uh, if you want to donate anything there, that's that would be much appreciated. And I just want to say a big thank you to all the sponsors um, that help support these great DDD events. Uh, without them, we wouldn't be able to have the events. So um, so yeah, thank you very much. And finally, uh, please feel free to tweet about this on social media. Um, we've got the hashtag DDD2020. Uh, and um, the account um, is developer day if you want to tag that. Cool, so um, let me introduce my talk. So I'm gonna be talking about building next generation web apps with Blazor. Um, this talk is very much a code based talk. In fact, there's about three or three slides if that, um, and then we spend the entire time in Visual Studio actually working with an application and actually building real Blazor code. Um, what this talk won't be is an introduction to the fundamentals of Blazor. So I'm going to assume you've heard of Blazor, you know what it is roughly, and you've maybe done a little bit with it, or at least you've seen some basic stuff with it. Uh, I'll quickly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Chris. I'm a principal software engineer at Deployed. I'm also a Microsoft MVP. I do blogging. I've been blogging on my blog at chrissanky.com for a while now. Um, but my main focus at the moment is writing a book. So I'm writing a book for Manning called Blazor in Action. Um, and um, wherever possible, if I can fit it in, I also do a bit of open source work. On the note of my book, Manning have also been really kind um, and given a 35% discount code for anybody um, to use. And that works on all of the Manning products. So you don't actually have to use it to buy my book. You can use it for any of the Manning uh, the Manning books, but um, that code there, um, if you use that at checkout, it will get you 35% off whatever uh, whatever product you want to buy. Cool. So anyway, what are we going to talk about? Well, we're going to talk about sort of four things. Um, we're going to talk about organizing apps, uh, forms and validation, JavaScript interop and authentication and authorization. Um, these sort of are, are tend to be the fundamental sort of starting points really for most people when they're getting into Blazor. So I thought these would be a good things to, to cover in the talk. And I'm not joking, that is it. It is all code from here. We are done in uh, in PowerPoint, basically. So um, let me swap over to uh, web browser. And this is the app that we're going to be working with today. So do, when we work on this Blazed Repairs app, this is a, some fictional repairs company. You can see that there's not a lot going on in this app. We don't have a dashboard page. We don't have this new repair page. Uh, the only page that actually does anything is this view repairs page, which is uh, just loading up some, some uh, records from from the server uh, whether the the repair has been completed or not so this is what we're going to be working with and if i jump over to visual studio this is the solution so um, this solution is using a template called the blazer web assembly asp net core hosted template which is a really sh uh, sort of short snappy name um, and essentially what this means is that we have uh, a blazer web assembly project we have an asp net core web api and we have a shared class library. OK, so that's what you're getting when you pick this template. Now, in terms of uh, some tips around organizing apps, I'm not going to go into loads of detail about this, but I really, really dislike the organization by type principle. Um, it tends to be what you get with, a, with the default templates. Um, I don't really like it. I don't think it scales very well in real world apps. I've had a few bad experiences with large MVC apps. Um, with like 300 controllers and 300 views and 300 models and all in separate folders and you're trying to work on a feature jumping around between all these folders and files and it becomes a bit of a nightmare. So I really like feature folders for, for web app development. So that's what I've got here. I've got a feature folder and un underneath that feature folder there are other folders that define each of the features of the app. So we have a dashboard, um, we have the new repair, we have the view repair. So we saw that earlier. And then any anything that's shared, anything that's common goes in the shared folder. So I've got a card that's shared across uh, multiple components and I've got the layout for the application that's in shared as well. And if I expand these out, you can kind of see how this starts to scale. So um, we've got a header bar that's kind of like a sub feature of the layout, the nav menu, and, and we can open those up. They, these have all got all the files that are relevant to that particular feature. So what we've got in here is SAS files. For starters, so this is for uh, the styling side of things. 
I'm, um, I really like SAS. I think it's a really great way to manage your CSS. Personally, um, I'm not a fan of scope CSS. Um, I personally, in, in like 15 years of web development, have never had issue with CSS conflict. So for me, I, I'm not sure of the problem it solved. It's not something that I find when I'm writing apps. Um, and scope CSS kind of breaks the point of CSS for me. So I personally stay away from that. And uh, I prefer to use SAS files and, and I can put um, the styles that are relevant to the particular feature in a SAS file in that feature. And I can pull them all together at build time uh, into a single minified file. So it's really good for maintainability. Um, you can find the styles that you need for a particular component really quickly, uh, but you get all the benefits of cascading styles through your application. The other thing that I want to point out in terms of organization that I do is with feature folders, you can end up with quite a lot of components in a folder. Um, so when it comes to knowing which particular component is the page for that feature, that can become quite tricky because in Blazor, the only way you really know this is to open up the component and look and see if it's got this page directive at the top. So what I like to do is add page onto the end of the, of the component name. It just makes it easier to spot if you've got quite a few sort of normal regular components inside of a feature folder. Cool. So that's sort of really what I'm going to, that's kind of what I'm going to talk about organization wise. There's not really a huge amount to it. I don't think it's that much more complex to be honest. So um, that's, um, that's what I do. Um, so let's start talking about the first topic. So we're going to talk about forms and validation. Now, if you remember back on our site, this new repairs page, it doesn't have anything there. We want to have this ability to record new repairs. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to start off by going into our new repair feature and we're going to open up our new repair page. So there's not a lot here at the moment. We're just uh, referencing that that card from that shared folder that I mentioned earlier. That just gives us that nice white border. And then we've got a header and the, and the page directive. So I'm going to paste in some code to get us going. So I've plonked in quite a lot of stuff here, but most of it we don't have to worry about too much at the moment. We're going to focus on this bit in the middle, OK? So the key thing I've done here is I've added a normal HTML form tag. And what I've got in there is uh, several input con controls. So I've got an input, a text area select um, that are going to collect the various pieces of information we need to record a repair. I've then got an action on the form and a method um, for posting it. So that's all pretty kind of standard stuff. So what happens in Blazor if we if we just use that? So um, let me just uh, let that build go through. There we go. So if I hit save now, you can see that it's all kind of bust. And that's because, you know, we want to really post up to an API with JSON. Uh, this is going to try and do an HTTP post. It's not going to it's not going to be in the right format. As you can see, it's unsupported media type, blah, blah, blah. So this isn't great. So how do we work with with a form in Blazor in the first place? Well, firstly, we need to kind of move the handling of the form to C sharp. So First things first, we need a model that represents the data that we're going to collect. So in our case, we're keeping this model in the shared project. So in the shared project, we have a repair model. And in there, we've got uh, sort of a simple POCO that's got properties on it that represent each of the data points we're collecting. So we're going to new up an instance of that uh, in this field called repair model. So once we've got that, the next thing we need to do is actually get the data into that model. And to do that, we're going to use Blazor's bind directive. So I'm just going to. Uh, update this code. And what I've done is on each of the various inputs, I've added the bind directive. So Blazor's bind directive, which is this bit here, this app bind, is how you uh, perform two-way binding in Blazor applications. So what this is going to do, this is quite an intelligent uh, directive. It knows that, uh, understands HTML controls. So it knows that it needs to bind to the value attribute on the input. So it's going to do that automatically. And whenever that value changes, it's going to work both ways against this particular property that we specify. So we've done that. That's all good. In fact, there's only one more uh, or a couple more things we need to do now to get this to work. We need to create some kind of uh, way of posting this up to our API. So I'm going to do that next. I'm going to pop in some code here. And this handle form submit is a regular C sharp method. And it's going to use an HTTP client and it's going to use the new JSON helpers and it's going to post up to that endpoint that we had before. And it's also automatically going to serialize this to JSON for us. And then if we get a successful response code, it's going to show a success message and reset the form by newing up the, re the repair model. Uh, the HTTP client, if you're curious, is being injected at the top. 
and it's being injected using the inject directive. This is how we do dependency injection in Blazor components. So it's just inject the type that you want and then give it a name. So that's the repair page. The last thing that we need to do is um, deal with this form action part because this isn't going to work. So what we need to actually do is override the on submit event. So we can do that as well using Blazor's on submit handler. So you can see the difference between a Blazor event and a regular JavaScript event is this at symbol at the front. OK, so what we're saying here is when the form submitted, cancel the default event, use this one instead, which is our handle form submit. So if I hit save on that now, I'm going to jump back over. I'm using um, .NET 5 here, by the way. So what you've just seen as the page refreshed is the new auto refresh that came. It's one step closer to hot reload. Um, but this is going to every time I save a file, it's going to automatically rebuild uh, the project and refresh the browser for me. So with all that in place, hopefully we've now got something that will work. So if I say John Smith, um, he's got a broken, uh, he's got a broken tap. And he's got a phone number. Like so, and I hit save. You can see that we've now saved the repair successfully. If I go over to my view repairs, you can see that we've now got John in the system, um, which has worked really well. So this is great. We've not had to do a huge amount there to get this working with Blazor, but we do have a slight problem. If I hit save now, it still successfully posts. And if I go here, I've now got bad data in my system. So this isn't very good. So what can we do to improve this? Well, what we need to do is we need to add some kind of validation to our model to make sure that the values are what we expect them to be. So in order to do that, I'm going to go to my repair model here. I'm going to update it. And I'm going to update it to um, use data annotations. So if you've not heard of data annotations before, they're the kind of default um, validation mechanism that's built into ASP.NET Core. But there are other validation mechanisms. There's things like fluent validations. I'm quite a big fan of that. Um, and I tend to use that more than data annotations, to be honest. But essentially with data annotations, what you do is you decorate each of the properties with the validation uh, attribute that you want to apply to that particular field. So for name, excuse me, for example, we're saying that's a required field issue. It's required and it needs to have a minimum length and then contact number. It's required. And then um, we've got this really, really succinct, easy to understand regular expression. I mean, I'm sure most of you don't need me to explain this to you, but essentially uh, that is just making sure we have a valid UK formatted number. So yeah, so the great thing about Blazor is this ability to share code between front and back end if you're using .NET in, in both on both sides. So all we've done here is added to that model. I'm just going to do a build here because I noticed when I was practicing this, it didn't quite work the other day. So if I do that, come back over here. If I go to my new repair now, all I've done, remember, is add those data annotations to that model. If I hit save, nothing's actually happening. And if I open the browser tools and have a look at the console, you can see that we're actually getting error messages back now from the API. And the reason that's happening is because the server is now rejecting um, our API call because we don't meet the validation rules. So that validation has been automatically picked up by the web API and have been applied. And now we can't post bad data. So that's really good. Um, but we still don't have very good UX for, for our client application. Nothing's telling us that, that something's wrong here. So let's fix that next. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to end up, we're actually going to replace this whole form, OK, with some different, some different parts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to paste in some code. And what I've done is I've swapped the HTML form tag for an edit form component. So this is a component that is built into Blazor. Um, it ships out the box. You can see it here. And it really is just a drop in replacement for an HTML form. And under the hood, it actually renders a form um, when it when it gets to runtime. Now, it works in a very similar way to what we had before. We have to provide a model. So this is saying, like, what, what's the model? What's the data representation of, of this form? Like, what's it going to handle? So we pass in our repair model. And what's really cool about this is it's got some helper methods for submitting. So it actually has three different ways we can submit or we can deal with submit, sorry. So it has on submit, which is exactly the same as the HTML um, form on submit. We would have to do any manual validation and things like this. But what it has is this help, this other version called on valid submit. And I love this because when uh, I submit a form and I'm using the on valid submit um, event, my handler will only be called once all of the validation on the form has passed, which means I don't have to worry about checking any values in, in my handler. I can just post that to my API knowing that it's already met 
the criteria of my of my validation. So that's really, really useful. The third one is one called on invalid submit, and that's so you can do something if the form is invalid. Um, so yeah. The other thing that I've done um, with this code is um, we've updated each of the individual HTML controls and we swap them to components as well. So I've got an input text component, input text area, input select. And again, these are just drop in replacements for the regular HTML elements. Binding to them is working the same as it did before using the bind directive. There's a slight different syntax here. So because we're using a component and components um, uh, define uh, parameters, sort of their public API, if you like, um, we have to sort of say what particular one of those parameters we're going to bind to. So in this case, all of these components um, have a property called value um, with a capital V. So we're saying bind to the value property on this component. So that's what that's doing, but it, it's the same two way binding as it was before. Cool. So we've updated those bits. So what the last kind of bit we need to do is tell the edit form how to validate um, this particular model, because the edit form, um, like a lot of things in Blazor, has been built in a way that it's not tied to a specific implementation. So Blaze is a pretty unopinionated framework when it comes to stuff like this. You can plug in whatever you like. So in our case, we want to use data annotations. So we have to tell it how to do that. And we do that using the data annotations validator component. But adding this component or adding a different version of this, that's it, that's how easy it is to swap validation mechanisms. So for example, one of my Blazor packages um, is called Blazor Fluent Validation. And as you can probably guess from the name, it has it defines a fluent uh, and a, uh, fluent validations validator that you can use uh, to use fluent validations with your forms. And to use it, you just literally take this line out and replace it with um, a fluent the fluent validations validator component, and bang, just like that, your form will now use fluent validations instead of data annotations. So it's a real nice plug and play model. The other component I put in here is this validation summary component, and this is going to display any error messages in the form. Um, as they as uh, whenever we submit. So if I save that and I'll jump back over to the app, we're going to see that auto reload happening again. Now, hopefully when I hit save this time, we're going to see error messages and we do. So that's great news. Um, you can see a bit of extra styling and stuff here as well. So I've got these red borders around all the various inputs. Um, this is this is something that I've added. It's part of the theme of this particular app that I built but it's enabled by using those input components I, I showed you a second ago. So by using those input components, Blazor is going to apply CSS classes depending on the validation state of the form. So you can see here for the name, that's currently invalid. And you can see if I start typing and I tab out, it's now changed to modified and valid. And you can see that it's now got a green border around it as well. So I've, de I've defined the CSS classes that make the borders red or, or green, depending on these, these CSS classes. Um, but Blazor is those uh, Blazor components that are swapping those classes in out. So there's a real benefit to using those components over regular HTML um, form inputs. So cool. So that's looking pretty good right now. We've got validation um, that's showing up to help the client and we've got protection on our server. So we're all good. The only thing I don't really like about this is this validation summary. I don't think it's a great UX. Um, if you've got a large form, you don't want users having to scroll up and down the page to go and find their validation errors and then scroll back down to find the particular field that it was affecting. So let's see if we can just improve this slightly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of the validation summary component. And now I'm just going to update this code. Now it's all exactly the same, except each of the individual fields now has an extra uh, component to it called validation message. And this validation message component, as you can probably guess, is going to specify validation messages, but for a specific property on the model. And we do that using the for parameter. We're passing in uh, the particular property on the form that we want this, um, this component to be bound to. So if I save that and I go back over, we'll let that reload. And now if I hit save, we get validation messages directly under the field that they affect. So this is a much nicer experience. So if I do John, He's got his broken tap. Um, he'll need a plumber. And he puts in his phone number and that's all valid. We can hit save. And now we've successfully uh, entered our repair data. And if we go up to our view repairs, we can see John and his broken tap is in there correctly. So that's forms and validation. Hopefully you've, uh, hopefully that's been really clear and hopefully um, you, know, you can see the benefit of using the Blazor components uh, for handling your forms. Um, ben, I don't suppose we've got any questions from that section, have we?
No, I'm guessing not. I'll move on to the next bit. Cool. So um, the next thing we're going to talk about is JavaScript interop. Now, this is always an interesting topic to talk about with Blazor because uh, a lot of people see Blazor as a way of removing JavaScript uh, from their life, which I can understand. Um, I'd be, I'll be honest, I've got a bit of a soft spot for JavaScript. I've used it for a lot of years. I, I've done a lot of Angular um, originally. So, um, so yeah, I'm kind of quite used to it, but I, I appreciate why people feel that way. Um, but what I think for me is that Blazor, while that allows you to write largely C sharp and pretty much exclusively C sharp if you if you really want to, um, there's a lot of really great JavaScript libraries out there that are, that you can really leverage um, to take shortcuts in your code. And what I want to show you is it's not really that difficult to work with uh, those JavaScript libraries, and we can wrap them into a C sharp API to make them easy to deal with to the point that, to be honest, you could almost forget their their JavaScript underneath the hood. So. What we're going to do is on that, um, if I go back to the code, uh, the, the website, sorry, um, we're going to update this dashboard uh, page. We're going to add a chart to it and we're going to uh, sort of have it show the outstanding repairs versus the completed repairs because that sounds like a cool thing to show. Um, to do this, we're going to use a JavaScript library called Chart.js. So that's in the, the JS folder of the www root. Um, you can see it here, this chart min JS file. Um, it's a very popular library. It's really well battle tested, and this is a good reason to use it because you know all those bugs have been ironed out, hopefully. Um, so it's a really stable library, with, and it's very feature rich. So in order to do this, we're actually going to add our own JavaScript file first. So I'm going to go new item and JavaScript file, and I'm going to call this chartwrapper.js. And in here, I'm going to pop in some code. Now, I'm going to shrink a lot of this because, frankly, a lot of it, well, pretty much all of this is boilerplate largely. There's only a couple of bits that I really want to highlight to you. So the first one that I want to highlight to you is um, this one at the top. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating an object on the window, which is like the global scope for JavaScript um, called Blazor Repairs. Now, the reason I'm going to do this is because to access uh, JavaScript functions from Blazor, we always do it relative to the to the global scope, relative to that window object. So in order to avoid collisions uh, names with other functions, um, I kind of want to namespace it in a way. It's probably the best way to think of it. So to do that, I'm going to create an object called my application name, and then I'm going to create all my functions within that. So it kind of creates that almost like I say that kind of namespacing style. And in there, I've got a single function called build chart. And this function takes an element. And the reason it takes an element is because we need to pass an element to chart.js so that it knows where to render our chart, okay? And then everything below that is basically boilerplate that I will be upfront and honest here. I have literally copy and pasted from their getting started guide, okay? So it's got some dummy data in it, and we're just gonna use that to check that our, 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 our um, interop is working correctly. So it defines the type of chart that we want, so a bar chart, and then uh, the labels and the data set that we're gonna render. So that's what's going on there. So now we've defined that, we're going to add in uh, onto our index.html, we're going to add in uh, uh, script tags to reference both chart.js and our wrapper file. So we've got them in our index.html. And now we've done that, we can start focusing on the Blazor element of it and we can start defining some components. So we're going to do this in our dashboard feature. So I'm going to come into the dashboard feature, I'm going to add a new component. And we call that chart, okay? So we're going to call it chart.razor. So inside of here, I'm going to add in the code for this. So what we're doing with chart, uh, with the chart component here is we're defining a regular HTML canvas element because that's what chart.js likes to render to. But we need a way of telling it that's where it's going to render. So we need to capture a reference to this particular HTML element that we can pass down into JavaScript. And we can do that using this um, ref directive that Blazor provides. And we use that in tandem with a type that, again, that Blazor provides called element reference. And this allows us to capture a reference to an HTML element in C Sharp and pass it via JS interop into JavaScript. And Blazor is going to do the conversion work to make it understandable from both sides of the fence. So all that's really left is to actually invoke our function to create our chart. So we're going to do that using uh, the JS runtime. And that's injected at the top here, this IJS runtime. And we're going to use it inside of this method called on after render. Now, on after render is one of three lifecycle methods that Blazor components have. So Blazor components have on initialized, on parameters set, 
and on after render. Now there are some others to be fair, but they're the three kind of key ones you're gonna be working with on a regular basis. Now on after render is the one to use for JavaScript in the role. There's two kind of key reasons for that. One is if you're doing any pre-rendering, um, then on after render does not get called on the server. So that's good because otherwise you'll get an exception because there's no JavaScript runtime when it's doing pre-rendering and that will blow up. Secondly, most of the time when you're doing JavaScript interop, you need the uh, HTML elements that are inside of your component rendered to the DOM in order to interact with them from JavaScript. So on after render, as you can probably guess from the name, only happens after the component's been physically rendered into the DOM. So in our case, we need this canvas element physically in place in the DOM before we can render a chart in it. So that's the other reason we use on after render. Inside on after render, we're making a call using JS runtime to this invoke void async method. So there's two methods on the JS runtime that we use. We've got invoke void async, which we're using here, which um, you can, again, for the name, um, is something where we're going to invoke a function we're not expecting a return value there's also another one called invoke async and that's where we can get a return back value back from javascript so remember with uh, javascript interop it's both ways we can go javascript to c sharp and c sharp to javascript now they both take their first argument um, is always the uh, the path to the function and that's always relative to that global scope so you remember i said we're going to create a object um, and then we're going to create our functions within it so you can see that here, blazed repairs and then build chart. And if I jump back to the chart wrapper, you can see we've got blazed repairs and then build chart. And then after that, we just have a params array and we can just pass down as many values as we want. Now, in our case, we're only passing down the element. So I'm going to pass in that element ref that we caught up here and that will get passed down into that JavaScript function for us. So that's our chart. The last thing we need to do is actually render this somewhere. So I'm going to update the dashboard page um, and reference that component. So that's all I've done there. And if I go back to our page and refreshes, and just like that, we have got a chart rendering using JS interop. So hopefully you can see that's not been too painful to get us going, okay? And we can see it's rendered all of this nice interactivity with this um, sort of hover effect and this uh, little bubble with some metadata in it. So that's really, really cool. But it's not really very used to us right now because this is all just plain data. So how can we actually make this more useful to our application? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to come in here and we're going to update this build chart function, OK, because at the moment it's not really a lot of use. So let me just pop in uh, an updated version of this. Now, all I've done with this um, this update is I've removed all those hard coded data sets and the chart type and I've swapped it for variables. So data now is no longer um, hard coded. It's now a variable and so is type. And both of those are going to be passed in. We're going to pass both of these in from C sharp. OK. So we've got, we're now going to pass in the element, the type, and the data. That really does make this code basically boilerplate. There's nothing really here we need to modify or change. We can do everything we want to do going forward from C sharp. So we can actually close this now and pretend that it doesn't exist anymore. Everything we're going to do now is going to happen in C sharp. Now, because we've removed that data structure from JavaScript, we need to create a C sharp representation of it so we can pass that down. So that's what we're going to do next. So I'm going to add a new class. And we're going to call this chart data. OK, and then we're going to pop that version in. So uh, da, 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 where am I? I need to go in here. Cool. So again, you don't really kind of need to understand all the details of this. Just be aware that this is a C sharp version of that structure that was in JavaScript, that hard coded data that we originally saw. So there's a list of labels and a list of data sets, essentially. And this is what a data set looks like. But again, we've kind of created that now. It's relatively speaking boilerplate again so we can just sort of save that and we can shut that and kind of forget about it next we're going to update our chart component so we need a bit more information here now we need to um, be able to pass a bit more information in so what we're going to do is define a couple of parameters so these are component parameters and component parameters are the public API for your component. That's the way to think of them. And we define them by creating public properties that are decorated with the parameter attribute. So what we're doing here is we're saying anyone who uses this component um, should pass in the data they want displayed and specify the type of chart that they want displaying. So we pass that in there, and then all we need to do is pass those pieces of information down into JavaScript. So we can update uh, this JS call, and we can pass in the type and the data down into that JavaScript function. So you can see now we've created a complete C Sharp API wrapper for that, um, that JavaScript library. Um, and now we're just going to work with this chart component going forward. 
So we saved that, we've got that updated. The last thing we're gonna do now is update our usage of it. So we're gonna update this dashboard page. Now I've popped in a bit of code here, we'll, we'll step through it all. So first things first, our chart component, we're now passing in that data and that type. So we're saying, this is the data we wanna render and this is the type of chart we want it to be uh, displayed as, so a bar chart. To do that, we've got a field here called uh, using the type chart data that we created. And then we get into some methods. So the first one we have is our on initialized async. So that's that lifecycle method I mentioned a second ago. This only runs once in the lifetime of a component. OK, it'll never run more than once. Um, so it's great for doing stuff like we're doing here, which is loading the initial uh, list of repairs data. So we're going to go and get that from our API using the HTTP client. And that was in injected at the top as before. And we're just going to pass it into this method called create chart data. And that the job of that method is to do one thing, one thing only. It's to uh, take that repairs data and convert it into that chart data object we created a minute ago, that, that C sharp representation of that data structure that chart.js needs. So that's what that's doing. And that just gets passed into our chart um, over there. So if I save that, we go back to our app. Hopefully that will refresh and we now have our, our, our relevant data. So we have our completed repairs over here and we have our outstanding repairs over here. Now, the great thing about this, like I say, we've now got this C sharp wrapper around our, our, um, our library. So if I go back to the code and I'd say, right, actually I want a pie chart now, I can just go in here, change this to pie, come back, let that refresh. And after a second, we now have a pie chart. So you can see, I could give this, uh, sort of wrap this in a, a shared library. I could give it to someone. And they might not even know that it's using Chart.js under the hood. Um, I can just tell them what the API looks like and what values are valid, and they can just uh, sort of use it from C Sharp as they wish. So JavaScript interop isn't too intimidating in, in, in Blazor, and I think the team have done a really great job at creating some nice clean APIs for us to use. So um, so yeah, so I hope that's, that's useful. Um, again, Ben, have we got any questions on that section? Um, we have had a question come through um, with the band directive. Is there a way to register a default property on a component so you can do at band instead of needing at band dash value? No, there's not. You have to be specific with the bind directive. So you have to tell it what particular uh, component you need. Uh, yeah, you want that 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 property bound to. Um, yeah. I'm just trying to think if there's, I mean, I guess technically speaking, there's no reason why it, it, you couldn't specify that in some way, shape or form. But I think um, the, the, the IntelliSense from, from all the IDEs kind of basically writes that for you. So it's, it's not too much of a big deal, really. Um, but, but yeah, there's nothing built in. Cool. Um, nice. So let's get on to the last section then. And we're going to talk about... Um, authentication and authorization. So um, let's close this, all these bits down and we'll reset all this. Now, um, I appreciate authorization, authentication is um, is a tricky subject. Um, I'll be honest, I, I hate it, <laughs> really hate it. In 2020, it stuns me that it's still so complex, so convoluted and so easy to get wrong for something that's so important. Um, so, I've really tried to distill this down uh, to, to kind of give you some good principles um, and, and, and show you some stuff about how uh, Blazor works under the hood with validation. Um, I'm going to try and really be very explicit about the bits that are there to show you what's going on versus what you should necessarily follow in terms of uh, patterns and practices. So um, at the moment, our app has got no authentication to it at all. Um, anyone can view this app. We can view all this data and people's phone numbers, which I'm sure is a horrible breach of GDPR. So um, we should definitely secure this somehow. So the first thing we're gonna do before we do anything else is we're gonna go to the server project. Now, this is uh, this is kind of security 101. The server is the main point uh, that must be secured, okay? We don't want to um, ever trust any client applications. And Blazor WebAssembly is a client application. It, the code is downloaded and run on the client. That means it can be tampered with, it can be modified. Um, so we can't trust anything that comes from it. So the first things first, we must secure our server. So we've got a couple of controllers here in the server. This repairs controller is what we've been using to get our data. You can see it's got some hard coded data here and it's got the endpoints for um, uh, adding a new one and getting our repair data for our chart. So the, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna add the authorize attribute 
onto this controller. Um, and now we've done that, if we go back over to our, our application, you can see that we're no longer displaying data. Okay, our chart's not rendering, our view repairs, there's no data here. And that's because if we look in the browser dev tools, you can see that we're getting 401s, okay? We're not authorized anymore. Um, we can see it down there. Um, so just by adding that attribute, we've secured the server and the, the client can now lo no longer access the data. So that's our, our primary job done as a developer. We've secured the most important part. Now, what I want to be clear about here is anything that we're about to do in Blazor is to create a nice U UX experience for the user, okay? Anything we do, it can be overridden, it can be circumvented, it can be, it can be tampered with, okay? So what we're trying to do is create a nice user experience for people who are following the rules, okay? And that's all we can do in Blazor. Never ever put anything into your Blazor WebAssembly application that is sensitive, okay? Because it can be gotten at and it can be tampered with. So what we're going to do to secure uh, or sort of do the authorization um, with our API is um, we're going to use JSON web tokens. Now, one thing I want to be clear about here is I've hand rolled this because I want to show you what's going on. Um, do not hand roll this stuff. It is not something you want to hand roll. Um, you want to trust a, 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 an identity provider that does this for you, something like Identity Server or Azure B2C or Azure AD or uh, Auth0 or Okta or any of those companies, um, don't do this stuff yourself. The last thing you wanna do is hand roll it, get it wrong, and uh, find ywself on have I been pwned. Uh, that would not be ideal. So just to kind of show you what's going on under the hood, um, I've got a login method here on the login controller. And what that does is it checks hard-coded username and password. Again, something you should never ever do. Um, and basically, if, it, if they match one of those, um, I'm just generating a JSON web token that's sent back to the client. And then the client will send that token with every request to basically prove who it, it, they are, who they say they are. Um, so that's what's going on there, but I'm not gonna linger on that because like I say, um, this is more for showing you what's going on than something you should actually uh, practice yourself. So let's move over to our client now. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna work through um, building in uh, the, the uh, nice UX for each of, our, um, each of our pages here. So let me just, um, Get my snippets right. So we're going to add that same authorized attribute to each of our page components in our Blazor app. So this is the same app that we just used in the API uh, controller. This is all shared code. So um, I'm going to save that. I'm going to do the same thing on the new repairs page. OK, and pop that in, that in at the top there. And finally, on the view repair page, I'm going to pop that in there as well. OK, so we've added that authorized attribute to each of those pages. but that is not going to have the same effect that it did when we added, to, added it to the API controller. We're not magically now going to uh, have a logged out and a logged in view and unauthorized and all this. And that's because, um, excuse me, there is lots of different ways we could secure a Blazor app. OK, so you could have had some custom authorization system. Um, you could have multi-step authorization, all this kind of stuff. So what we need to do is def uh, tell Blazor how to recognize an authenticated user. And to do that, we need to create something called an authentication state provider. So this is something that if you're using um, a OIDC compliant server, so B2C, Azure AD, identity server, um, things like that, um, there's built in ones for you. You don't have to do this stuff. But this is just kind of to show you really what, what, what's kind of going on under the hood. So I'm going to add in a new class um, and we're going to call it token. Um, Authentication, oh, authentication, sneaky W. Got to call it token authentication state provider. And then we'll add in uh, the code that we need for this. So um, there's quite a lot of code that I've just popped in here, but I'm just going to break this down because, again, um, it's more about what the, 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 the kind of overview of what's going on than the actual specifics here. So Firstly, when you're creating your own one, you need uh, to inherit from authentication state provider. This is an abstract base class that has a single uh, method on it called get authentication state async, and we need to provide an implementation for it. Now, what happens is all of the Blazor components that are authentication aware, um, they all um, use the authentication state provider and, and call get authentication state async to, to, to know whether the user is authenticated or not. So we're going to tell it what authenticated means in our in our app. Now. What this code is doing, I'm not going to go through it line by line. 
is essentially it's going to look for a JSON web token in local storage. And the reason there'll be one in local storage is there's this login helper method I've created that is going to save the token that comes back from the API, that one we saw on the login uh, controller. It's going to save that into local storage if the login was successful. OK, so we're going to pull that out and see if there's one there. If there's not one there, then the user's not authenticated. OK, and they're going to and we're going to treat them as a not authenticated user. If there is one, however, we'll create a claims identity for them. We'll also update the um, default request headers for the HTTP client to include that token every time it makes an API call. And that will mean that they'll be able to access the, the data on the server. The other method that's on here is the logout method. And all that does is remove the token from local storage. So literally that token being present in local storage is enough to sort of tell us whether they're authenticated or not. Like I said, in um, something like an OIDC library, this is far more in depth. It checks the uh, expiry time of the token and all this kind of stuff. So like I say, this is more just to give you a rough idea of what's going on under the hood. So now we've got that provider in place, we need to uh, do some stuff with dependency injection. So I'm going to add some services into um, our uh, da, 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 don't want that one. So I've just got to update some uh, using statements here. So I've added in a, uh, a few bits and bobs. Let me I'll do this because talking and doing stuff, typical man can't do two things at once. There we go. So what I've done is firstly, I've put in some infrastructure stuff that enables authorization in Blazor. OK, so there's options and add authorization core. I've also added in a, um, some services for my Blazor local storage library. That's for saving the token in and out of Blazor local storage. And then I've got our token authentication state provider. I'm adding that as a scope service to the service collection. And then finally, what I'm saying is any component, and this is the Blazor built in Blazor components that request an instance of an authentication state provider. Um, don't give them the default one, give them our token authentication state provider. So I'll be calling our get authentication state async method. OK, so that's what I'm doing there. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to the app component. This is the entry component to a Blazor application. And I'm the, the last thing I'm going to do in here is I'm going to update it uh, because by default, it's not aware of authorized um, behaviors either. OK, so this root view component is the component that actually loads pages. Uh, but it doesn't understand that uh, authorized attribute by default. So we're going to replace it for something that is um, aware of it. And that is the authorized root view component. So it's exactly the same, except it understands um, the authorized mechanism and it gets an instance of that authorized um, authentication state provider. So when we do this, we can specify a template for what people see when they're um, not authorized. So in this case, we want to show a login, um, which makes sense. So we've got this login feature. And inside of here, um, we've just got some code that I commented out a while ago before I started. So I'm going to bring that in. That's just the form that takes the username and password, posts it up to that login API and, and, and waits for the response. OK, so with all those bits in place, we should now be able to go back to our app and we can see that we are being presented with our login uh, component. And if I click around, you can see I can't access any part of the app at all because um, I'm, I'm logged out right now. So let's see if I can log in. So if I go in here and I say user and I say user one exclamation mark, my super secure password, you can see that I'm now rendering uh, my chart correctly. Um, my view repairs is now showing all my data. So this is excellent. So I'm now authorized uh, in the way that we've specified authorized. OK, but this still isn't quite quite right. Not everyone should who's, who's logged in should necessarily be able to view the data here. So we've still got all these contact numbers and they're quite sensitive. So maybe we only want certain people within our organization to be able to view that. So what we want to do is add in a role now. So we say only people in a certain role can access uh, a particular piece of information. So in this case, we're going to say only people in the role of planner can access this view repairs data. So how do we do that? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to go to our view repairs page and we're going to update it in here. So I'm going to replace what we've got by default, which is rendering out that table with the repairs in it. I'm going to add in this other component called authorized view. OK, now the authorized view component allows us to specify chunks of markup that you must be authorized to view. So we could use this on an unauthenticated page um, and only have a section show to authorized users. Or in this case, what we're doing is saying this particular uh, piece of markup is only viewable by people who are authorized and in the role of a planner. OK, um, we can then say uh, the authorized people can see that same card and that same table that we had before. 
anyone who's not authorized, so not in that role, they're going to get this not authorized uh, card being shown instead. So if I save that and go back to our app, that's going to rebuild, reload, and now we're seeing not authorized, okay, because I'm logged in as a user. So I can click around, I can still see my dashboard, but I just can't get to that sensitive phone data that I had before. Now, this is actually looking quite good, except for one kind of big problem. Um, I'd like to show you this data working as a planner, but as you can see, I've actually got no way of logging out, which isn't very good. So let's see if we can actually sort that last little bit out. So the last little bit we're going to do is we're going to go into our layout, go to our header bar, and we're going to create a new component in here. So we're going to call this user status. And inside of this component, we're going to use that same authorized view component again. But this time we're not going to specify any roles around it. Okay. What we're going to say here is if a user is logged in, no matter how they're logged in, um, show this show this piece of markup. Okay. And that's just a simple me menu that prints out their name and gives a logout button. Okay. And it calls that logout method on the token authentication state provider. Now, what's cool about the authorized view is we can access user data using this context object. Okay. So I can say context, and I can get to user. Uh, I can get to their identity, I can get to their claims, um, and I can get to their roles and stuff like that. So it's a really helpful component. So if I save that, and then if I go back to my header bar, I'm going to add that component in. We'll go back to our, uh, our application. It's going to rebuild for us. And now you can see in the top right now, it's saying, hi, user, and we've got an ability to log out. So I can log out of here now. I can come back. I can say I'm a planner. I can log in and now I can see my view repair data and I can still get to everything else because obviously a planner I'm allowed to, um, but I can get that little bit of extra functionality. So that is it for me. Um, I'll just finish off my last uh, slide, which is just some useful resources if you're getting into Blazor. Um, the one key one, biggest one here I'd say is the awesome Blazor repo. It's amazing. It's got links to basically everything else that I'm showing on here. So um, it's definitely the one to remember out of all of these. Um, there's also a short link actually from this from Microsoft. It's aka.ms slash awesome Blazor. Um, so that's a, if that's a bit easier for you to remember. But um, definitely check any of these out if you're getting into uh, your into Blazor and, and wanting to learn more about it. Um, and that is it. So thank you for watching and um, thank you for giving up your Saturday morning. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of DDD. And I think we've got until 10 o'clock. So if there's any questions, we'll work through them. Uh, right. So uh, we've got some questions coming in. Um, firstly, if you identify a bunch of JS scripts in your index file, will there be a performance overhead for that? Um, Depends. Yeah, I mean, technically, yes. Um, so every like a browser has a limited number of connections it can have to download files. So if you have, say, like 50 JavaScript links um, in there, it can, I think most browsers can do four at once. So four concurrent connections. So it's going to have to do four, then four, then four, then four. Um, what you would what I suggest is um, in a production app, it's no different to a, a JavaScript app, really, to a React based app or Angular or whatever. Um, you'd need to imply some kind of employ some kind of bundling and minification that would take all your JavaScript files and bundle them together and minify them. Um, I'll be honest, the tool chain at the moment for .NET is not great for this. You probably need to use the JavaScript tool chain. Um, the, the .NET ecosystem has obviously only been dealing with this for probably re in reality, probably a few months because Blaze is only really starting to pick up or is sort of only picking up uh, big momentum now, even though it's been going for sort of three years almost. Um, but the tooling is not is not quite there yet to keep everything in C-sharp world. So, yeah, so for now, you'd need to do some kind of bundling and minification, and it would probably be using some kind of NPM, something like Webpack um, to do that. So the next question is for I local storage service. It, where's the data actually stored for that? Yeah, so that's stored in the browser. So if I, I'll just quickly jump back, actually, I can show you. So. Inside of the browser, there's two built in mechanisms for storing uh, data. Um, there's local storage and session storage. So if I go in local storage here, which is on the application tab, you can see here's that token that I've stored. OK, so it's a key value store. So it's the name and then the value that I'm storing. There's also session storage. So local storage is going to persist over multiple sessions. I can shut the browser, come back to this site and that data is still going to be there. Session storage is different. That will only last for the lifetime of the tab. So as soon as I shut the tab, it's going to be destroyed. So 
there's a couple of different mechanisms there that you can use to store short and long term data, basically. Um, but the local storage library, my Blazor local storage library, all that's doing is providing the interop to save your stuff into that and pull it out again. Um, is there a native MSAL library for Blazor? Yes, yes. So um, out of the box, um, Blazor supports um, M, uh, MSAL uh, via B2, uh, so if you're doing B2C or, or Azure AD integration, um, all the MSAL library is already built in um, for you. Um, there's loads and loads of great docs on Microsoft. So you go to blazor.net and go to the doc site from there. They've got a whole section on authentication. Um, they have then a subsection for each type of, of Blazor app. So Blazor WebAssembly, Blazor WebAssembly hosted, uh, Blazor server. Um, and then they show all the different ways that you can auth authorize through that using MSAL. So there's B2C, there's Azure AD, um, and there's walkthroughs of all of that. So um, yeah, you can find all that on the docs. Um, yeah, just hit that up. Uh, next question is, how would you list several roles within the auth view element? Yeah, so, um, oh, I've done this for a while. So uh, I think if I remember correctly, it's just a comma separated list. So it's um, where, where I had planner in that code, if I jump back, uh, where am I? I want to go in my view repair page. So I've got my role planner there. I think it's just a case of going like planner user. I think it's just as simple as that, if I remember correctly. Um, sure, that was the way that, yeah, comma, comma delimited list of roles. Yeah, so just like that. Uh, so the next question is, does Blazor offer any opinion on how API validation is returned to the client when doing client server comms, i.e. Um, HTTP 404, 400 um, error codes with details or 200 success with some kind of wrapper with a success Boolean and errors as well as a payload? OK, yeah. So no is the simple answer. Um, there's a very good reason for that is because um, Blazor has been developed specifically to be quite unopinionated um, and allow lots and lots of different ways of doing things. Um, so in that particular instance, um, Blazor is going to behave like any other SPAR does making HTTP calls and the API and it's going to expect the API to act like any other HTTP API. So when that returns a 200, it's going to expect you to deal with that in your app the way that your app needs to deal with it and a 400 or a 500 or whatever, um, it's going to expect you to deal with that in whatever way your app um, is going to deal with it. Um, it's pretty trivial to create these these wrapper classes. Um, I, I create them all the time. Um, so usually I have a simple class called API result and just always return that and that's got a success ball and a payload in it. Um, it's quite trivial to do, but there's nothing built into Blazor for that. And I, I very much doubt you'll ever see that either. Uh, the last question we've got is, is there a switch version of the other as view that lets you show different views based on the role? No, there's not. What you would have to do in that scenario is you'd have to specify multiple authorization views for each one. So instead of doing like what we've got here where we've got uh, role planner and so this would show for both planners and users. If you want to show one thing for a planner but another thing for a user, you would actually have to specify two of these. So you'd have to go right. Here's what I want to show if if someone's in a is is authorized as a planner, and this is what I want to show if someone is authorized as a user. Um, there isn't any way to kind of go, oh, based on the role, do this or do this or do this. Um, I think that's all the questions we've got for now. Excellent stuff. Cool. Um, lovely. Well, I'd say thanks everyone for coming, and um, yeah, enjoy the. Enjoy the rest of the virtual DDD. There's some amazing talks throughout the rest of the day. So um, I know I'm going to be watching a few of them. So um, so yeah, that's it. Thanks very much for coming. Uh, we have just got one more oh, okay. question yeah. through. Um, uh, in terms of code organization, where do you put the code for data access with DAPA or any framework, for example, in the shared folder? Oh, OK, um, well, in this it, it, th this particular app that I'm showing here is a WebAssembly app, so I wouldn't be doing any data access on the client because it, it's separate from the server. So they'd have to go through an API call and therefore that code would reside on the server and it would be wherever you particularly wanted to keep that code on your server side. Um, for me personally, I'm a, I'm a massive, massive fan of vertical slice architecture. So I pretty much exclusively now use uh, CQRS, so I use a command and query. 
and I would have I, I don't tend to use things like um, repositories or anything like that I just kind of have a handler on the server and and again that's kind of grouped in a way that all the code for that particular handler is all in one place um, similar to like the feature folder style and um, it would all happen within in that particular handler so it, it really does depend what you're doing with your server application and it's not I'll be honest it's not really a blazer concern um, I don't think 